sure. All right, welcome. How's everybody doing? So glad you guys are here today. Hear the word from Isaiah 46. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Would you stand and worship with us, please? Rumors of the Son of Man, stories of a Savior, holiness with human hands. Treasure for the trader. No weir in her, no eye had seen the image of the Father. Till heaven came to live with me, a rescue like no other. Lift him up. You are worthy.
right, two things to remind you of today. First of all, we have our membership class that is coming up on Saturday the 22nd, taught by the magnificent senior pastor, Robin Tyler, in all of his glory. He will be there teaching you all from uh, 9 to noon that day. And if this is like, if you've always been wondering, like, should I become a member? What is GCC all about? If you've even been here for a while and you still have questions about what we believe, how you can get involved, this is a great opportunity. So come that Saturday, the 22nd, 9 to noon, get all the information, and you'll have the opportunity to become uh, a member or not. There's no pressure. Uh, secondly, wanted to let you know that VBS signups are up. Pre-registration is available for kids and volunteers. I'm sure we still need volunteers, but registrations have opened for kids, so make sure all those kids you want to get registered, get them in there before all these classes get filled and everything like that. So all of that is going to be on our website at georgetownchristian.org slash events. You can find out all the stuff there. All right, that's all I have. So turn to your neighbor, welcome them, and say, hey, I am glad you are here.
gravy rolls with a mighty triumph rolls. He rolls a victim from the dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He rolls, he rolls, he rolls. Hallelujah, Christ the Of reading. I'm going to be reading some scripture, and if you uh, would follow along, I'll be reading the words that are going to be on the screen in white, and then if you can respond, reading the words that will be on the screen in yellow, and then at the very end, we'll read them all together. So I'll begin. It's from Isaiah 46. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all of my purpose. My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, a man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purpose, and I will do it. Let's read this all together. Listen to me, you stubborn of heart, you who are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off, and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Amen. i 
deep in We do but Do you know that all the dark Won't stop the light from getting through of serving churches, mainly as a pastor, I've encountered several individuals that I would label as characters. The very first church I served, I had a man in the church named Tommy Sharp. First time I met him, he said, my name is Tommy Sharp, but I'm pretty dull. <laughs> there was nothing dull about Tommy. 
When I became pastor, his wife had been dead a few years, and he came up to me one Sunday after church and said, I need to talk to you. I said, sure. He invited me to his house. He said, I want you to put one of those personal ads in the paper because I want a new wife. I said, all right, what do you want me to put in the ad? He said, well, I want someone that will clean my house, mow my yard, cook my dinner, and if she does all that, I'll take her for a ride in my car. I said, Tommy, you're not looking for a wife. You're looking for a personal servant. He goes, put the ad in there anyhow. So I did, and he met someone, and she actually married him. I had another man in the congregation named Johnny West. Johnny wore bib overalls every Sunday to church, and he chewed tobacco and he spit it in a cup every Sunday. He drove a silver station wagon, and on the front of the station wagon, he had a sign that says, I'm not a dirty old man, just a sexy senior citizen. There was nothing sexy about Johnny. Had another lady in the congregation named Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen constantly complained about everything. She complained about the singing of the choir. She complained about my preaching. And she would oftentimes complain about anything and everything. And I would try to improve her mood. And I would say, well, Mary Ellen, it's a beautiful day. The sun's shining today. She goes, yeah, but it's going to rain tomorrow. She was the type of person who could find a dark cloud in every silver lining. Maybe you know somebody like that. When Jesus walked this earth, he chose 12 individuals, 12 disciples to follow him. These were several personalities that he was trying to blend into understanding what the kingdom of God was all about. We read about James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And they had the gall to come up to Jesus and say, when you come into your kingdom, we want to set one on your right hand and one on your left hand. The other disciples, when they heard about that, became indignant, the Scripture says, because guess what? They didn't think of it first. They were seeking power, not seeking the kingdom of God. Philip tells us about Nathanael. Philip goes to tell Nathanael about Jesus, and Nathanael says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? We may think to ourselves, can anything good come out of Georgetown or Greenville or Crandall? or New Salisbury, or my hometown, Floyd's Knobs. Peter tried to persuade Jesus not to return to Jerusalem because he knew that the religious leaders there were out to get him. And Jesus was not really happy with Peter, and he said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan, in Matthew 16, 23. Judas, who was the treasurer of the group, he was a thief, He stole from the money bag, and he betrayed Jesus with a kiss. All these individuals were characters. What about us? Are we characters? Do we seek the seat of power like James and John? Do we want to be recognized and lauded over and given the best seats in the house? Do we question somebody's background when they're committed to Jesus like Nathaniel? Well, this guy made a commitment to Christ. You know where he came from? He's from from Crandall. You know what they say about people from Crandall, don't you? Do we try to tell God how things should be like Peter, especially if we do not like the answer from God? Do we betray Jesus with our words and our motives like Judas? How many stripes have we put on the back of Jesus? The answer to all these questions is yes. We have done these things. Despite our actions and our sins, our character defaults, Jesus paid the penalty for all of us by dying on the cross, taking on our sins and rising to new life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8 that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still characters caught up in our sin, doing things with no regard for Jesus or his word or our fellow man, Jesus died for us because he loved us so we could experience his grace through his shed blood. The Bible tells us in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, 
to lay down one's life for his friends. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become not only his friend, you become his son and his daughter in Christ. As we celebrate communion today, let us examine our hearts, our motives, our words, and our character so that we might be in right relationship with God and our fellow man. David wrote in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a pure heart and renew your spirit within me. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. We give you thanks for his love, that he loved us despite our character defaults, despite our sin, despite the things that we have done wrong in this life. But we know through the blood of Jesus Christ, and through our acceptance of him and our baptism, we become one with him. Thank you for this gift, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. That time of reflection, clearly about our King Jesus, but uh, it's okay if you would also like to clap for Leighton and uh, Mark. I heard like one snippet of that rehearsal this morning. I was like, that's probably for the Melton wedding. I'm sorry, yeah, you know, the wedding coming up next week, and man, I was so excited to hear that that was now. All right, so uh, make sure that you guys have a handout from the back, and uh, you guys follow along there with me. We're uh, still in 1 Samuel, so we're covering chapters 7 through 15, nothing like uh, getting a bunch of those done at once. Um, Some of you have probably played uh, billiards or pool before. Some of you may be legendary at it. Uh, Some of you may have one at home, and uh, you know probably what it's like, even if you don't own a pool table, to to hit that lucky shot. But it's always fun to act like you had control of that the whole time, and you totally meant to get that ball in that pocket over there while you're looking at this pocket over here. And I'm sure that some of you, maybe uh, maybe as a child, I'm guessing, might have been in the yard and grabbed an ant and stuck it in a mason jar, and then you felt that sense of power over the life of that ant. And we won't go on about all of the terrible things we probably did with 
those ands. So, uh, and then some of you even today, like me, will make a plan to accomplish all of your errands. And in your amazing foresight, you will decide that I'm going to go to Grantline and uh, like me, you may decide I'm going to work out and I'm going to get groceries and I'm going to get a, well, you might get a haircut and then I'm, uh, <laughs> and then I'm going to swing by the bakery on the way home and maybe even get a car wash. Authority, knowledge, power, we have like all of these little tiny abilities or qualities or characteristics just like our creator. But we're talking today about God's sovereignty because we see that theme in 1 Samuel 7 all the way through 15. And you see it all through scripture, but it's foundational to our understanding of who God is and our responsibility as citizens in his kingdom. Now, whether he actually chooses to exert this infinite power and control that he has is a different question that we're not answering today. Uh, let's not err on an oversimplification thinking that if God can do it, that he then must do it. We are not saying that. The, the cartoon version is sort of like depicting this God that um, necessarily must do everything that he can do or then he's not sovereign. And that is a, that's an entirely false picture of a sovereign God. He can be truly sovereign without doing everything he could possibly do. So how then do we as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, or how then do we as members of his body, how do we see his sovereignty, or how do we see his infinite power, his infinite presence, and his infinite knowledge at work, both in scripture, and then what the question we're probably asking today, how do we see that at work in our everyday lives? So if you're in 1 Samuel chapter 7, our first blank we want to fill in, God works with us. God is sovereign, and God works with us. If you, uh, <clears throat> maybe you were a guest last week, and you joined us again this week because you're on a new journey of faith, not all the days are going to have big words like sovereign, but it's only two syllables. Hang in there. You can do this. It's not going to be complicated. It's the end of the big word. Sovereign's the only one we got. <clears throat> Only one we have for today. I'd like to read from 1 Samuel chapter 7, 9 through 11. And as I read, we're going to see that in God's sovereignty, he's working with Israel to defend the promised land. Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. This is immediately on the heels of Israel repenting of using the ark and imagining that they could just... Uh, take God's power and use it as a little magic wand. So they've repented. Samuel is now crying out to the Lord for Israel. The Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel, but the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel see our participation the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below Beth Car. Both God and Israel work together. So in my estimation, Rusty will have better numbers. Probably dozens of us helped in the 300 hallway renovation that is, I think it's now in cleaning stage. Probably, th probably dozens of us helped over there. Now, could Rusty have done all of that work by himself? and probably better, I'll speak for myself, better than I could. Of course, Rusty could have done that, but we were allowed to join Rusty. Not that Rusty's God, but we have to understand this. Look at how God is now loving the earth and all that is in it. Last week, we celebrated Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. And then we look forward to his ascension and the, the sending of his Holy Spirit that then through us, expresses that love that we have to the world. Jesus says it this way, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one. And we've got key words here, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So it becomes our joining in God's work of loving this world 
and everyone he's put in it. So we're on still number one, God is sovereign. God works with us. And our second blank under that, number one, was God works with Israel. Number two is God works with Saul. God works with Saul to defend and reestablish that promised land for the people of Israel. Samuel 11 tells the story of Nahash. If you want to flip there, feel free. I want to summarize so that we can kind of get through a couple chapters. In 11, he tells the story of Nahash the Ammonite and his attack on Israel. He threatens to gouge out the eyes of the men of Jabesh and to force them to serve him and the Ammonites. Now, God is still working out his sovereign will. The Israelites are not going to serve another land. They're not going to serve another king. They were purposed to serve one true king. So the Israelites, I wonder if we see a little something of Hebrews and Israelites, what we would now call modern-day Jews. I don't think that this is racist. I think that it is in their blood. I think that you can see right here the Israelites begin to bargain. And this time right now they're bargaining for peace. They're saying, man, just give us some time. Just give us a little more time. We need to send through the land, and maybe there's some help out there somewhere. And Saul hears the news that they're under attack. And so Saul's response is then to, he's plowing a field with oxen, to chop up some oxen, to send those pieces of oxen throughout the land of Israel with messengers, saying this message, whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. So a literal death threat. But also encouragement, you guys should join the battle. And wouldn't you know it, 330,000 men arrive to battle. The men of Jabesh get word of their help soon to arrive. They extend their, their respite or their break just for another 12 or 18 hours, long enough that by the next day, the Ammonites were defeated to such a degree that Scripture says, quote, no two of them were left together. See, God is sovereign, entirely powerful, powerful, knowledgeable, infinitely uh, present, yet he chooses to work with Saul and with Israel to defeat his enemies and to establish, reestablish, defend the borders of Israel, to bring his people to himself. God is sovereign, yet he chooses to work with us just the same. He works through humans. Now, we might immediately begin to think, oh gosh, we're talking about Saul and Samuel and probably Moses and Joshua, and don't forget Abraham and Elijah and Peter and Paul, and we think of all of these giants of the faith, but we have to think about Margie, who writes, I was grocery shopping with my older son, who was maybe two or three at the time, uh, and he was on the spectrum, but we, we didn't know all about what that meant yet. We knew it meant that he had a speech delay. He couldn't really put into words what he was feeling, and in no manner did the two line up at any point. So he would have very strong feelings, and he would not be able to express it for a very long time. So naturally, as we're in the checkout, we stand in this line that won't move forward, and the older lady in front of us is starting to shoot angry glances over her shoulder, and eventually she glares back at my son and she seethes, be quiet. I start to feel red and blush and I probably should have taken him out of the store. My items were on the conveyor belt. We needed to get home and we needed this for dinner at home. Flustered, I fumble my payment. I pack my groceries. I rush to the parking lot. I slam my son in his car seat. I shut the door and I collapse against the outside of the car as the tears a frustration, and the waves of anger begin to wash over me. He didn't ask for this. I didn't ask for this. Why can't people simply be quiet or, or ask how they can help? Why does it have to be sniping with angry words? A lady not much older than me gently approached me and whispered, I can't offer any advice, but I can give you a hug. And she hugged me. Love entered my most painful moment that day when a stranger simply hugged me. We don't have to be a giant of the faith to join God, even a perfect 
sovereign king and expressing his love to this world and living out kingdom values. God is sovereign and God still chooses to work with us. That was our first point. Our second point, just a second. Uh, Like a vulture, this man, he's searching, he's circling for a parking spot. Can't find one. Getting frustrated. Lord, he prays, I cannot stand this. Please open a parking spot for me. And I'll go to church every Sunday, I swear. So somebody beat me to the punchline? Okay, in case you haven't. Uh, The clouds part, the sun shines down, the spot is with, with very close proximity to the exit, just the way he likes it. He pulls in and he says, without hesitation, actually, never mind, I found one. (laughs) our second point God is sovereign God works sometimes in spite of us God works in spite of us it may be telling that this is a larger segment than the first part I'll say it's telling for me God works in spite of this will be your blank right under that number one under the second point God works in spite of of Israel. God works in spite of Israel. Instead of summarizing, I'm going to read a segment of scripture, but I want to ask you to look for something right after we set this up. This is when Israel asked for a king. Now we just read in seven where God worked on their behalf. God worked with them. In conjunction, they worked because they repented. Samuel prayed to the Lord. They worked together to accomplish God's sovereign will. Now, in spite of Israel, (laughs) In chapter 8, remember Samuel, you're old. (laughs) Following that, Samuel, you're old. Now appoint for us a king to judge us. And this is the critical piece. This is the piece that is, this is the piece that that indicates their sinful desire, like all the other nations. Uh, God had even said it in their hearts in uh, Genesis. Uh, He had even set forth the idea that there would be a king. The frustration is that they're not trusting God as king, and further, They want to be like the other nations. So let's just view Israel as uh, wholly sinful right now. Not that they're wrought with sin, but they're behaving sinfully. So a sovereign God chooses to work through Israel in spite of them. So observe this. Uh, This will be on the screen. You can also read it in your own scriptures. 1 Samuel chapter 8, and I'm starting in verse 10. What I want you to see is these words, he will take. And and what I think we can see is a duality of God's both, God's judgment and God's willingness to hear the cries of his people. So all I can say is that has got to be some level of power and knowledge and presence that you and I don't have. But as citizens of his kingdom and as subjects of a true and faithful king, We have to ascribe some kind of word to this. So sovereignty is what we've come up to encompass all of that. But look at how he does both through these verses. So uh, your three words, he will take. Uh, So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and reap a harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them <clears throat> to his servants, and he will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants, and he will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. And our sixth one, he will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will answer you on that day. Israel choosing 
a king wasn't sinful. But Israel trusting an earthly king to be like others in lieu of God, the true king, is distinctly different. And God is still accomplishing his purposes. He is both executing judgment and remaining faithful. This is important to note. God is establishing the role of a king to lead his people. But we're also seeing in this image of a king that Saul and Israel both were far short of what God expects of a king. All right, your number two under God is sovereign. God is sovereign and works, you probably guessed it, because you're logical folks, in spite of Saul. So uh, another quick summary, <clears throat> if you'll allow. Saul had reigned two years as king. Uh, around that time, he would mustered a full army of about 3,000. He was defeating smaller groups of invading Philistines. And he was also claiming all the fame. He was claiming the fame and the success of his troops, of his own son, Jonathan. This encouraged the people, and it helped them get out on the battlefield for the next battle. But it also amped up. This is kind of this little, we never see this when Satan lays it before us to say, maybe you should claim that. It also amped up the pressure on Saul. It amped it up because he had said that he'd done these things. So then when the Philistines come, what do the people expect? Saul to be the great conqueror that he says he is. So now Saul feels all this pressure because of his braggadociousness. He feels all this pressure when in fact it was the Lord that was working. He feels the pressure now to perform, to accomplish what he's told people he accomplished. So he's in an impossible spot when <clears throat> 6,000 Philistine horsemen, 30,000 Philistine chariots, and Philistine troops as numerous as the sand on the shore by the sea are all poised to attack Israel. Scripture records that Israel saw that they were in trouble. Their response was to hide in caves, to hide in cisterns, to hide in...
and the rest we should devote to destruction. Verse 16, then Samuel said to Saul, stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. You got this. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity. Thank you. And idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So recapping, the, the Lord, God, is sovereign, and he works with us, and he works in spite of us because he's a sovereign Lord. He demands obedience. In the same way that God required Saul's obedience, he requires our obedience. Saul failed, Saul failed to even communicate to the Israelites what their job was when they were going to fight against the Amalekites. And then adding to that failure, he blames them for not being faithful to God. The time was 7.49 a.m. I need you guys to be able to hear this story without being freaked out. So don't be freaked out. You should still have these bottom two blanks blank. It's okay if you fill something else in, but we'll get to those in a second. Just listen. The time was 7.49 a.m., December 7th of 1941. Commander Mitsu Fukida of the Japanese Imperial Navy was admiring the billowing white clouds and brilliant sunrise as he led a squadron of 360 Japanese fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes over the Hawaiian island of Oahu. Just four days after his 39th birthday, Fukida was in charge of a bold gamble by Imperial Japan knock out the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor in one blow. This would allow Japan to reign free in their conquest of Asia and the Pacific. Seeing the, pe- <clears throat> seeing the fleet peacefully at anchor 300 meters below his plane, Fukita smiled as he ordered, all squadrons plunge into attack. And then he radioed back to the Japanese fleet 230 miles away, Tora, Tora, Tora. The attack had begun. What followed was, in the words of President Franklin Roosevelt, a day that shall live in infamy. Of eight battleships in the harbor, five were destroyed, 14 sunk or damaged, more than 2,300 Americans dead, dying, or trapped in the hulls of sinking ships. Fukita later described the day as the most thrilling exploit of my career. And at that same time, Sergeant DeShazer of the U.S. Army Air Corps was on KP duty, peeling potatoes in an Oregon base. He hears the news over the radio and launches the potato against the wall, screaming, the Japs are going to pay. The down payment for DeShazar was to volunteer to join a special squadron being formed by Colonel Doolittle, whose mission was to take the war straight to the Japanese in a daring bombing raid over Tokyo using B-25s from the USS Hornet. In military terms, the Doolittle raid was only a pinprick, but as a morale booster for Americans, it was a stunning success. But the Shazer's B-25 ran out of fuel before it could reach a safe area in China, and he and his crew were forced to bail out over Japanese-held territory. Consequently, the Shazer would then spend the next 40 months as a prisoner of the war In Japan, 34 of his fellow pilots in solitary confinement, tortured routinely, burned a hatred of the Japanese into an inferno raging fire in his heart. As fellow American prisoners were executed or died of starvation, disease, or torture, the Sager remained alive, although barely. His solitary confinement gave him time to ponder the human condition. He wondered what could cause such hatred among fellow humans. And faintly remembering some Sunday school lessons from childhood, he begged his guards for a Bible. It took two years. 
but he finally received a Bible, and he devoured it, page after page, gulping down God's word, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, and God's redemption. He later wrote, I discovered that God had given me new spiritual eyes, and that when I looked at the enemy officers and the guards who had beaten me and my companions so cruelly, I found my bitter hatred for them changed to loving pity. I prayed for God to forgive my torturers, and I determined by the power of Jesus alone to do my best to acquaint these people with the message of salvation I received as well. On August 20th, 1945, a smiling young Japanese guard swung open to Shazar's cell and said, war over, you go home now. The Shazer wrote a book called I Was a Prisoner of Japan, and after studying at Seattle Pacific College, returned to Japan. If you're not hearing right now, listen very carefully. Don't miss this. Listen, he returned to Japan, this time as a missionary to his former enemies. Only a sovereign God can work with us and in spite of us, to build a missionary out of the midst and the death of war and torture and turn him into something who looks kind of like his king. Someone who says, I'm going to lay down what my enemy did to me, and I'm going to, to travel to where they are and share the love that I've experienced. So your uh, second to last blank, God is sovereign. God will work both with us and in spite of us. God will both work both with us and in spite of us. And this is your very last blank. God will work out his will. In 1 Samuel 9, 15, through chapter 10, verse 10, we can see God's sovereign hand at work in the very bringing to kingship Saul. We see donkeys lost. Just imagine all of these events. We see donkeys lost. We see servants carrying bread. We see servants preparing meals. We see uh, arrivals and departures of people from and in and to and from different cities and towns, we see everyday lives of people woven together to bring about the anointing of a king over Israel. And like we said before, at the same time, executing a judgment on Israel, setting up an image, although faint and absolute failure, an image, a shadow, a projection of what's to come, in their hearts, and now ours. We're left to conclude nothing, but God will work out his will. Proverbs 16, 9. Uh, I think I memorized this when I was a teenager, and it has become so true as you live life. How true is this same verse for you? Many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord determines his steps, and you can't fail to see that as you read Scripture and reflect on how God works. So we have to bring this all home. We have to discover some kind of a takeaway for today, some kind of a, hey, we're everyday people trying to become fully devoted followers of Christ as a body and as individuals. So I want to ask these questions just as a body. When a mom is at her wit's end, maybe she won't be in the grocery store parking lot, and maybe it'll be a dad. But when they're at their wit's end and you get to observe that really sloppy but sometimes sacred moment, will we view that as an opportunity to walk alongside, to work along with a sovereign king? Or will God work in spite of us? Or when we're led by imperfect leaders, whether that be a local or a national political leader, or whether that be a boss at work, or whether that be parents in your house if you're just a kid or a teen, 
will we despair or will we put our hope exclusively in a sovereign, true king of kings? Even today, God is still working out his will, both with and in spite of us, in spite of Israel, in spite of Saul, and pointing to the true King Jesus. Paul writes it this way, and we know that for those that love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Moses wrote it this way, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So a moment of reflection, and then I want to finish our story and we'll be done today, but just as a moment of reflection, what is God possibly using in our lives today? Maybe it's last week, maybe it's this moment this morning, maybe it's later today, or, or even uh, moving into next week, what is What is God possibly using in our lives to accomplish his purpose? Because we agree he will accomplish his purpose. Is there something he may be using in your life today? How might even the challenge, remember Hannah at the outset of this book, suffering, not having a son, barrenness, shame. How is God using maybe pain in our lives to bring about his good that he wants to redeem, to say, I can take your pain and I can make it joy and I can do it for my glory. I wonder if there's anything in our lives where maybe a loss we've suffered is an opportunity for his light to shine in the world to someone that doesn't know him yet, maybe sees the hope that you have and has to inquire. How can you have that hope? in the midst of the darkness you live through. Maybe God wants to bring about great change in your life or your families by the way that you respond to what you're living through right now. So we have to ask the question, are we joining God and his kingdom work and in expressing kingdom values like loving God and loving our neighbor? Or is he going to work in spite of us? God will work out his will. <clears throat> if you have a decision to make this morning, I, I want to finish up the story. But as I tell it, as the praise team sings, I would hope that you're reflecting on the, the way that a true and powerful king, a sovereign king, can affect his will with us or in spite of us. What is it that maybe he's doing right now in your life? Through pain, through victory, through just challenge. It wasn't a result of your sin but difficulty that the outside world is watching us walk through. How is God working? With us or in spite of us? Fukita, for the Japanese, the hero of Pearl Harbor, certainly not for us, was part of the Japanese task force that was going to attack Midway Island six months after Pearl Harbor. But he had appendicitis and was evacuated to the rear. During the massive air battle on the 4th of June in 42, Japan lost hundreds of planes, hundreds of pilots, and five ships, including all its aircraft carriers. A crippling blow. Later in the war, Fukita was in Hiroshima the day before the first atomic bomb dropped. But he was called to an emergency meeting at Navy headquarters in Tokyo on that day and survived the war unscathed, the only Japanese pilot to survive from beginning to end. After the war, he returned to a life of farming, filled with shame because of Japan's loss, but still with a heart of warrior, he was living a very unsatisfied life. Even though married, he kept a mistress mistress in Tokyo and made infinite excuses to travel to that town to his wife. On one day in October of 48, while getting off the train in Tokyo, Fukita saw an American handing out leaflets in Japanese. The title caught his eye, I was a prisoner of Japan, written in Japanese. 
it grabbed his attention immediately, especially since it started out talking about Pearl Harbor. Fukita was determined to learn more about this man, not out of any interest in Christianity, but because he wanted to know more about a man named Deshazar. Even though they had been enemies, he admired the courage of the Doolittle Raiders, but he was taken with the Shazar's testimony too. A friend told him to get a Bible, but Fukita could not find one in Japanese. And a few days later, on the same platform, and I wonder, was he still pursuing that same sin? On the same train platform, a Japanese man stood with a box of Bibles written in Japanese. Get your Bible, food for your soul, the man cried in Japanese. Struck by the impossible coincidence, and despite his Shinto heritage, he bought one. He was struck by Jesus' words in Luke 23, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Fukita later wrote, I was impressed that I was certainly one of those for whom Jesus had prayed. The many men I killed had been slaughtered in the name of patriotism. For I did not understand the love of Jesus Christ. He changed from a bitter ex-war hero to a man on a new mission. Fukita went on to become an evangelist throughout Japan and Asia. And he and Deshazer eventually became close friends. Today, they're eternal brothers. A testimony to the power of a sovereign God who can work with us and who will work in spite of us. A sovereign God that is a true king. Our Heavenly Father, it's our prayer that you would be finding us willing to work with you. It's our prayer that you would make us into the image of your Son, that you might find us faithfully living out more and more kingdom values, that we might begin to have the characteristic qualities of Jesus, of you, of being someone who is willing to lay down life, not on a cross, although maybe, but specifically in an everyday simple cross the parking lot to enter the pain of a mom that just suffered some harsh words in a stressful time in a grocery store. That we would begin expressing a love that is willing to say, those who tortured me, I will go back and share your love with. Father, would you transform our hearts and our lives that we might look more and more like our true King Jesus? Would you do this for your glory and for your kingdom? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please? I have tasted all that this world has to offer. Gone that leaves you wanting more but can't satisfy. And Father, forgive me for taking so long to see that you're all I need. With
Lord, may we say that, that we surrender all that we are. We give you all of our remaining days to your service, to do your will and pursue you, to show love like you loved us. Lord, may we say that. And may you work in us and through us and not in spite of us. Help us to just get out of the way and surrender ourselves. Get rid of our stubbornness or our apathy. And Lord, may you work through us through your spirit. And may we do the work that you have prepared in advance for us to do. And may we see you do amazing things in this world that needs to see you and not all of us standing in your way. Help us in this, and thank you for your mercy and your patience. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.